Adventure Drama Daring Do! This is what usually comprises the works of author Alexander Dumas. You may know him for works like The Man in the Iron Mask, The Three Musketeers, and his classic revenge story, The Count of Monte Cristo. But believe it or not, his works of fiction are not entirely... well, works of fiction. Alexander's adventurous stories actually came from his larger-than-life father, but what really adds a twist to this story is that not only was his father a larger-than-life character, but he also started out life as the half-black son of a slave owner. Anyway, he was so impressive that he literally rivaled Napoleon, a fact that would cost him dearly and become Dumas' inspiration for the Count of Monte Cristo. So today, we're going to tell you the real story of the man behind the fiction. Roll film! In 1782, Thomas Alexander Dumas was born in Saint-Dominique, or what we call Haiti. He was born to Alexander Antoine Davy de la Pada... Pada... Mm. That word. And Marie Cessette Dumas. We know very little of Thomas's mother. It is unclear if she was a free woman or not. However, we know quite a bit about his father. Antoine was the son of a wealthy French family and at the time was hiding in Haiti from his family and the law. After a quarrel with his brother, he stole some of his brother's slaves and made for Haiti's mountainous region where he took up the life of a leisurely aristocrat. It was there that he met, or bought, Thomas's mother and had Thomas and two daughters with her. For the time, this might not have been such a bad situation for Thomas and his mother, if not for the fact that Antoine was a pure, unadulterated bum. And he was really just biding his time in Haiti until he received his inheritance. However, Thomas did luck out in that, unlike other countries where slavery was legal, people of mixed race were given about the same amount of rights as white people, such as owning property and holding positions in government. But... Like we said, his father was a bum. In 1775, Antoine received his inheritance and was ready to head back for France. He only had one problem. He had absolutely no money to make the voyage, and like we said, he was a bum, so nobody was willing to lend him the money. However, for Antoine, this wasn't a problem. He simply sold his wife and daughters and pawned off his son, who was only 12 years old at the time. Yeah, that's definitely going to require some therapy sessions. What kind of scarring having his family sold by his own father might have left on Thomas, we can't be sure of. But if human nature is consistent, he was most likely really confused and probably had some major trust issues with his dad afterwards. He had to be majorly confused when Antoine suddenly showed up again and purchased him back. He was then swept off to France where he was thrust into a life of luxury and put under tutors that educated him in riding, fencing, and all the things a gentleman of France would need to know. Also, upon entering France, because of the current laws, Thomas was immediately considered free. However, Antoine never went back for Thomas's mother or sisters, and he ultimately never saw them again. As your therapist, I believe you need to... Figure out how to make it look like an accident. In addition to his education, Antoine showered Thomas with lavish gifts, clothes, basically anything he wanted. From what we can tell, he was preparing him to be his heir. Eventually, Thomas grew into a whopping six foot one and was noted for being very handsome, something the French women quickly grew to appreciate. In short, he was in a glittering world of aristocracy that he was very adept at maneuvering. However, Thomas still felt the occasional sting of racism. Once, while Thomas attended a drama with a young lady, a naval officer attempted to flirt with his date. When he protested the naval officer's rudeness, the officer's friends attempted to make him kneel in apology. The scuffle caused them both to be arrested and both released without consequence. This may partially be what caused the decision Thomas would soon make that would change his life forever and thrust him into the adventurous events that would ultimately inspire his son's books. Shortly afterwards, Thomas's father married his housekeeper. We can only imagine how Thomas might have felt his father taking a much younger wife while his own mother and sisters had been left to an unknown fate in slavery. 
Thomas refused to attend the wedding, which provoked his father to restrict his finances. Okay, new plan. You disown him. Do you have a license for therapy? Sure, I drew one. So that was pretty much what Thomas did. He disowned his father and his life of leisure so that he could join the army. Antoine didn't agree to this until Thomas promised to never use the family name, to which Thomas was all too happy to oblige, taking up his mother's name, Dumas. He also abandoned his first name and for the rest of his life signed his name as Alex Dumas. It is something of note that shortly after Alex enlisted, his father passed and he didn't attend the funeral. Now normally, in France, if you were from a wealthy family, you could get a pretty high commission in the army right off the bat. But since Thomas had renounced his family name, when he joined the Queen's Dragoons, he was stuck in a little backwater post at the lowest rank possible. But he quickly gained notoriety for his strength and talent as a soldier. One story says that Dumas was strong enough to ride a horse, grab hold of an overhead beam, and pull himself and the horse up. His son reported that he could put his finger through four musket trigger loops and lift them up on one hand, while others claimed he fought three duels in one day, a probable influence for the three musketeers. But though he had physical prowess, France currently wasn't in any wars that required him. However, a bloody revolution and a man named Napoleon would soon seal Alex's success as a soldier and his tragic doom. As 1789 rolled in, so did the French Revolution. The message of equality for all men turned Alex into a staunch French Republican. As the revolution continued, Alex remained in the countryside, but as the tensions grew, by June 15th, the local populaces feared mobs and looting. Including Alexander, the dragoons were called in to protect the former estates of the Duke of Orleans, now under control by revolutionaries. Here, he stayed at an inn where he met Marie-Louise Labore, the innkeeper's daughter. He made a venerable impression on her when they first met. The story goes that she was being accosted by brigands, and like a romantic hero right out of his son's stories, Alex rode into her rescue. They must have hit it off quite well because by May of the next year, he asked Marie's father if he could marry her, to which the innkeeper agreed if Alex could achieve the position of sergeant. So Alex went on to Paris, where he was put under the command of Marquis de Lafayette and went on to become a member of France's first black-only military unit, Legion Noir, which was also under the command of his old fencing teacher, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. He soon proved himself by ambushing and capturing twelve Austrians. Shortly later, he returned to Marie, promoted four ranks above sergeant, and claimed her as his bride. As the French attempted to spread the revolution to other countries, Alex went with it. By 1793, his talent was noticed and he was made brigadier general. He was given the job of seizing two passes, but heavy snows hindered him. Unabashed, he and his men climbed up a sheer wall of ice by attaching ice picks to their shoes to enter an Austrian battery. He was so successful at leading the 53,000 men under his command that he earned the name The Black Devil. The committee in France praised his work and then promptly sent for him. And at the time when the committee sent for you, it usually meant they wanted your head to further some obscure political goal. Knowing this, Alexander more or less said, Heck no, and delayed returning to France. Wisely, in a time where death was dished out on every side, Alexander had become known for giving pardons for small crimes, earning himself the new name Mr. Humanity. This reputation made it so that by the time he did go to the committee, public opinion had turned in his favor, and it was less favorable for the committee to behead him. Instead, the committee reassigned Alex to a command in the West where he found the army practically feral, killing citizens left and right, and he had such difficulty in reining them in that he described them as evil. He was then tasked to an army that was under a relatively unknown commander named Napoleon Bonaparte, Despite their apparent size difference, the men had equally stubborn streaks that collided in an unfavorable way. As Napoleon's subordinate, Alex helped lead the expedition into Egypt, which was really more of a way for the French leaders to keep the charismatic and favored military leaders from becoming political rivals. 
However, Napoleon and Alex kept butting heads, especially when Alex, with his great stature and upfront fighting ways, caused the local opposing armies to think he was in charge and Napoleon was his servant. In addition to this mix-up, Alex and Napoleon argued about how supplies was being funneled, and Alex had no problem insulting Napoleon or his subordinate officers in front of him which led to the infamous watermelon meeting, a simple event that would seal Alex's tragic end. The watermelon meeting was like any meeting you might see in a guy's locker room. Basically, Alex was chilling with some generals and eating watermelon when they began to criticize Napoleon. Word got back to Napoleon, who told Alex, your six feet and one inch would not prevent you from being shot in two hours. Now Napoleon fully viewed Alex as an obstacle to his goals. Thus we come to the Count of Monte Cristo betrayal inspiration. For those of you who don't know the story, the Count of Monte Cristo is about a poor sailor who is accused falsely for a crime and put in prison for years. He then escapes with a map to a treasure that he becomes fabulously wealthy off of and uses to exact revenge on the men who put him in prison. However, Reality was much more painful for Alex than his son's classic story. On the voyage home to France, his ship docked in an Italian port. The French idea of deposing one's king's head had horrified the world, and this particular port decided to take the repulsion out on Alex. They arrested him as a prisoner of war. During his imprisonment, he was poorly fed and most likely poisoned by the jailer, which cost him his health the hearing in one ear, and the sight in one eye. Alex waited for the French government to pay for the release of one of their best generals, but it never came, and he languished in prison for two years. Meanwhile, Napoleon rose to power, and by 1799, he was in charge. But you can imagine that he wasn't too excited about getting his old rival released. In fact, he wasn't even concerned. He forbade anyone from ever mentioning Alexander Dumas' name again. The only reason Alex was released was because his wife, Marie, constantly wrote letters on her husband's behalf to the French government until they gave in. But even when he was released in 1801, he was not given the back pay for his service and was essentially a pauper. Also, the world of equality that had once allured him to the French Revolution was devolving. Napoleon's supporters were mostly pro-slavery, and laws were being enacted to illegalize mixed marriages and keep black veterans from living in Paris. In 1802, Alex's son and namesake was born. During the first four years of his life, young Alexander Dumas would watch his penniless father live in a country that he had fought so hard for, yet had failed to create the equality he desired. In the end, Thomas Alexander Dumas died in 1806 at 43 years old of stomach cancer. However, his son would carry his legacy on in his books, where in the world of fiction, he would give his father justice through the enigmatic character that people around the world today know as the Count of Monte Cristo. Wait! I want to show you something really crazy before you go. But subscribe, please. It would make me so happy. Now, what am I gonna show ya?